Welcome to Electron Line. In this example, we're going to show you how, how to find the potential stored in the sodium chloride crystal. Of course, sodium chloride is salt crystal. It has a, an ionic crystal so that half of the atoms are negatively charged, the other half are positively charged. And so the positive charged atoms, of course, are sodium. The negative atoms are called chlorine. They're, of course, ions now. They're singly ionized, which means that each atom or each ion carries a charge of a single electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So by pushing all those ions together into a crystal lattice, the lattice will store energy. Now the question is, will it be positive energy or negative energy? Positive energy means that you had to do work to get it all put together. Negative energy means that they would naturally settle into a crystalline structure like that. The guess is that it's probably negative potential energy because we know that those are very stable crystals and it takes a lot of energy to break them apart. So let's figure out how to find the total potential energy within a crystal like that. And of course, the, the idea is that the potential energy is equal to the potential due to one charge times the charge placed nearby that potential. So the idea then is to start with a single charge. So let's start with this charge right there. And since there's no other charges placed there yet, so we're going to do one at a time. So this would be number one. The potential energy stored by placing a single positive charge there, if none of the other charges are present, well, that's simply going to be equal to zero. Now placing a second charge there, and let's do all the positive charges first. Let's take this one as our second charge, and notice that the distance between them is across the face like here. Notice that the, uh, the distance of each side of the cube is equal to A. A is 5.406 angstroms, which is 540.6 picometers. An angstrom is 10, min uh, 10 to the minus 10 meters. So placing a second charge there, it's now at a distance of the the distance across the phase of a cube, which would be the square root of 2 times A. And so therefore we can say that potential energy 2 is equal to the potential created by the first one, which would be equal to uh, KQ uh, divided by R. Uh, not R, but it would be, well, definitely would be R, but what we're looking at here is, um, let me show you the, the general equation. So this would be equal to KQ divided by the distance away from the first charge times the the charge of the second charge. So here we have kq over r, but r would be the square root of 2 times a, square root of 2 times a, and then we multiply that times the next charge like that. So it would be q times q times, you know, the potential here. So this is equal to kq squared divided by the square root of 2 times a. All right, now we find the potential by taking the third charge and placing it there. So this is the third one. So potential energy 3 is equal to Notice that it is uh, the same distance away from this charge as it is from that charge. It's simply the diagonal across the face of the cube. Here's the bottom of the cube. There's the left side of the cube. So that means that we now have to, when we place a third charge there, it's going to be influenced by the potential created by the first charge and the potential created by the second charge, which means the potential energy is going to be 2 times k q squared over the square root of 2 times a. Remember that the distance between these two charges is equal to this. The distance between those two charges is equal to this. That 2 k, uh, k q over the square root of 2 times a is the potential by one of the charges times, we multiply times the charge of the charge that we place there. Finally, we got the fourth positive charge. And so therefore, you can see that the distance between these two is the, across the diagonal of the phase the diagonal of the face here on the right side, and the diagonal of the face on the back side there. So here we can say that the potential energy, by placing the four charge there, we have to do work to get it there, therefore it's positive potential energy. It's going to be equal to 3 times kq squared over the square root of 2 times a. So now, to bring all the positive charges together, we need zero potential energy, kq squared over the square root of 2 times a, 2 times kq squared over the square root of 2 times a, and 3kq squared over the square root of 2 times a. Remember, each time we place an additional positive charge there, it's going to be interacted with the ones that are already there. So now we have four total charges combined. If we combine those, notice that the terms all are the same, just with a different constant. So together, p uh, potential energy 1 plus potential energy 2 plus potential energy 3 plus potential energy 4 
is equal to 6 times kq squared divided by the square root of 2 times a. So that's the amount of energy required to put all those positive charges together. That requires a positive energy, so therefore no, they would not naturally do that on their own. You'd have to push them there. What about the negative charges? Now let's start adding the negative charges. Let's start with this one right here. That's the fifth charge. So what is the potential energy required to put the fifth charge there? Now notice, a negative charge wants to be close to positive charges, so there will be a force of attraction, so it will be negative potential energy. Notice the distance between this charge and that charge is just simply A. The distance between those two charges is A, and the distance between those two charges is A. Since there's three of them, we could say that it's equal to uh, minus, because there will be negative energy, K Q squared divided by A, and there's three of them, so minus three times that. And then there's interaction between this charge and the one at the other side of the cube, which is diagonally across the entire cube, and so the distance there would be the square root of 3 times a, and that would also be a force of attraction, so we have a minus k q squared divided by 3 times, oh, not 3 times, but the square root of 3 times a, for the interaction between this charge and the fourth positive charge. All right, now we're ready to bring in another charge. Let's bring in this charge right here. Let's call that charge number 6. So the potential energy for the sixth one is equal to, notice that this charge here is this close to this positive charge, that close to that positive charge, and that close to that positive charge. So in each case, it's simply the distance of one of the sides of the cube, which is A. So again, we have minus 3kq squared over A. Then we realize that number six is directly across, diagonally, from the positive charge over here, which is across the entire cube. So we have another one of those terms, minus k q squared over the square root of 3 times a. And then we realize that there's already one negative charge there. We're bringing this charge close to this charge. Notice that's across the diagonal of one of the faces. So the distance there is the square root of 2 times a. And it's going to be a, a repulsive force. So therefore, we need positive energy to put those two together. So plus k q squared divided by the square root of 2 times a. All right. We're almost there. Two more. Let's take this one, charge number seven. So the potential energy for charge number seven is equal to, again, with the positive charges, notice we're this close to this positive charge, that close to that positive charge, and this close to that positive charge. Again, a negative charge is going to be the distance A away from three positive charges. So it's going to be minus 3kq squared over A, because there's three of those. This negative charge is going to be diagonally across to this positive charge, across the cube, which would be another one of these terms, minus k q squared over the square root of 3 times a. Now, how does this one interact with the two negative ones already there, 5 and 6? Notice it's across the face, the diagonal of the face here, and the diagonal of the face here. So we have two of those repulsive forces, meaning you have to put energy into it to get it there. So it would be plus 2 times kq squared over the square root of 2 times a. And now our last one, that's this charge right here, that's number 8. So how much potential energy do we need to bring that one there? Okay, first of all, this charge is going to be distance a away from this positive charge, that positive charge, and this positive charge. So again, we have three of those where we're only a distance away from positive charge, and so it's attractive forces, so we have minus 3kq squared over a. This charge is directly diagonally across from this positive charge right here, so we have another one of those terms, minus kq squared over the square root of 3 times a. And notice now that this charge is now going to be in the presence of three negative charges that are already there, so there's a, a force of repulsion, so therefore um, we need to push to get that charge there. And notice it's across this face, diagonally across this face, diagonally across the left face, and diagonal across, across the back face. So which means we have three of these terms right there, so plus 3kq squared over the square root of 2 times a. Remember, the distance across the diagonal of a face is the square root of 2 times a. All right, so now we can add all those together. So this is the amount of energy it required to put the four positive charges together, and that's the amount of energy that it requires to add the additional four negative charges. Um, so, well, we have to add all this together, so let's do that. We have 
four of these are identical, so potential energy 5 plus potential energy 6 plus potential energy 7 plus potential energy 8 is going to be equal to minus 12 times kq squared over a. Notice we have 1, 2, 3, 4 of those, that would be minus 4 kq squared divided by the square root of 3 times a. And notice we have 1, 3, 6 of those, so plus 6 kq squared divided by the square root of 2 times a. All right, so that would be the amount of energy required to bring those three last, uh, the four last uh, negative charges together. So the total energy, P total, is equal to the sum of these two. So when we add these two together, so we have a plus 6 of this and a plus 6 of that, that gives us plus 12. So all together we get minus 12 kq squared over a, that's this term right there, minus 4 kq squared over the square root of 3 times a, and then this one added to this one gives me a plus 12 kq squared over the square root of 2 times a. And then, of course, it might be a good idea to factor out the kq squared in a, so that this becomes minus 12 over a, minus 4 over the square root of 3 times a, and plus 12 over the square root of 2 times a, all multiplied times kq squared over a. Oop, and I probably should, should get rid of the a because I've already factored that out. There we go. That's probably the cleanest way to write it. Right down here, I know I don't have a lot of room anymore. Let me take the eraser away so you see a little bit better. So that would be the total energy stored inside a sodium chloride crystal like that. Now the question is, is it positive energy or is it negative energy? Well, notice that there's two negative terms, there's one positive term, and since the 12 is divided by the square root of 2, that makes it less than 12, so you can see that the negative terms overpower the positive terms, which means there's negative potential energy, which means that it naturally settles into a structure like that. It's a lower energy level, and so sodium chloride would naturally fall into crystalline structures like that because of the negative energy situation. If you want to know what that is equal to, we can then calculate that. So the potential energy is equal to, so there's this quantity right there, would be minus 12, minus 4 divided by the square root of 3, minus 12 divided by the square root of 2, times k, which is 9 times 10 to the 9th, times q squared, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, we have to square that, divided by the distance a, which is 540.6 picometers, 540.6 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. All right, I left the units off, so it's a little cleaner to work with. And now if I find my calculator, here it is. Let's figure out how big that number is. So let's say 12 divided by uh, the square root of 2, and that's a negative number, minus 4 divided by the square root of 3, and then plus, oh, oh, I think I made a mistake here. That should be a plus, shouldn't it? I'm getting too ambitious with my negative signs. Let me try this again. All right. So we have uh, 12 divided by the square root of 12 divided by the square root of 2 minus 4 times 4 divided by the square root of 3 minus 12. Okay, so now I have the constant. Let me write down what that constant is. So that constant here would be minus 5.82 times whatever that number is. So let me now finish. So times 9e to the 9th times 1.6e to the 19 minus squared and divided by 540.6e to the 12 minus equals. And so the potential energy of a single crystal is going to be equal to minus 2.48 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. All right. Now the question is, if that's the potential energy of a single sodium chloride crystal, what would be the potential for a mole of crystals? A mole, so in other words, that would give us the enthalpy of formation of sodium chloride out of, out of sodium and chlorine atoms. 
So we know that one mole is equal to Avogadro's number, which is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23. 23. There we go. So notice that we have four of each atoms. So if we want to form in a, in a crystal like that, so if we want to form a mole of crystals, we take Avogadro's number and divide it by four. That's the number of crystals we need to make a mole. So one mole, one mole, we don't need to E there, divided by, I guess we don't need to E, uh, divided by 4 is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23 divided by 4, which is roughly 1.5 times 10 to the 23. So that's how many crystals you need for a mole of sodium chloride. Molecules, I should say. So all we have to do now is take this number and multiply it times this, and that gives us the enthalpy of formation for a mole of sodium chloride. So let's take that number and multiply times 1.5 e to the 23rd equals, and we get hmm, about minus 372,000, that would be kilojoules per mole. That would be the potential energy for one mole of sodium chloride. And that would then be the enthalpy of formation for sodium chloride. Now, if you look that up, you'll actually find that it's almost double that. So that's not quite the number. So this is a theoretical model, but then of course the interaction at the molecular level is somewhat different so that the forces are not quite exactly what they are for a theoretical model like this. But the, theor theor the theoretical model is actually pretty close when you think about the, the lack of detail when we think about how these structures are actually formed and how the size of the ions are actually formed. Notice that the positive and negative charges will be different sizes, so therefore there will be different interactions between them, but hey, it gives us a pretty good idea of how to do this. So there's a good example of how to find the potential energy stored in a sodium chloride crystal, or any crystal for that matter, we use the same principles. Again, the idea is that you bring one charge into the time, uh, in at a time and then see how the other ones interact as you bring them in one at a time, and each, of course, charge um, has its own uh, potential around it, and so we have to then take care of that interaction in each case, and so you can see how that builds up as you add more and more charges to it.